school bus driver struggles to get a restraining order and is later found dead. A seemingly innocent bystander call leads police to a dating app serial killer. A heroic fighter is celebrated, and a body is found at an elementary school. These are today's true 911 calls. Let's dive in. On October 27, 2015, Gloria Riley contacted 911 because her ex-boyfriend, Willie Smith Jr., appeared at her home unannounced in the middle of the night. Nine days later, she was murdered. I've been having a problem. I moved from where I, I've been making a complaint about this guy, Willie Smith. Now he's at my door, and I'm really afraid of him, and I've been trying to say, do a restraining order with him, but they said that it's nothing that I can do right now. But he's at my door now, and I'm really afraid of this guy. Okay, is he causing a disturbance of any kind, or what exactly is he doing? He's studying right at my door there. I was asleep, and I hear some kind of noise. And it's him at my door. And you said you're in the process of getting a restraining order? Well, they told me it was going to be hard because I needed a police record or something, which I have called before on him when I was living out in, um, in oh, I forgot, when I, when I was living in um, Wingate Circle. Okay. And how, you said you just moved to the 399 Glenwood? Yes, on the first, I moved from where I was because of this. Okay. And I, I'm afraid of this guy. Oh, my God. How did he find out where I live at? And you said his name's Willie Smith? Willie Smith, yes, ma'am. Okay. And I do have a record that I've been complaining before, and I moved out from over there. <laughs> Didn't know he knew where I stayed at. Right. Uh -huh. Or do you want me to stay on the line with you? It's up to you, whatever you feel comfortable. Stay on the line, please. Okay, I'll stay on the line with you, not a problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> And I live here alone. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, Procrea. This is scary. I don't like this. I see, I drive school bus and I get up and leave my house 5 30 in the morning, mm -hmm. sometime before then. Right. Oh my gosh. I don't even know how long he's been out there. Probably I've been on my back porch or whatever. I'm here to sleep. And you do want to meet with the deputy to make the report, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I need to find out what I need to do for the restraining order, but I don't want him around me, period. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Because I'm, I told him before, I have a restraining I thought maybe my family telling him that I have a restraining order on him, he would stay away. He stayed away for a good two months and now he's back again. Mm -hmm. He's probably somewhere on Sunday Lane somewhere, hiding in the bushes. Oh my God. Now I gotta go through this again. Palm Beach County School District bus driver Gloria Jean Riley was found stabbed to death in her home in the 300 block of Glenwood Drive. Police had been responding to a burglary call when they found her dead in her kitchen at the hand of her ex boyfriend, 48 year old Willie Smith Jr., who confessed to committing the crime. Smith and Riley had broken up the previous fall, and that's when he began to stalk her. Nine days before her grisly death, Smith had shown up at her apartment uninvited, and she had contacted 911 out of fear. But only just over a week later, she was dead. Riley had gone home on her lunch break to fetch some fruit for a colleague, Lily Johnson, when Smith had attacked. Johnson and Riley had reportedly just been making a stop at the home before returning to work. Johnson heard the screams of her dear friend and colleague as the victim walked through the door. Police found Smith walking towards them, covered in blood and confessing that he had hurt someone. The killer admitted that he was overwhelmed with jealousy over the fact that Riley had cut him out of her life and that she had started a relationship with someone new. He told police that he had broken into her home when she was not there and he had grabbed a kitchen knife and waited for her to come home to take her life. He was arrested and charged with first degree murder as well as armed burglary. He was held without bond. According to the Department of Corrections, Smith had been jailed for four years for robbery and aggravated assault and was released in 2001. But this time, he would not be a free man again. Upon discovering their beloved colleague's death, bus drivers who had worked with her since as early as 2001 when she began working there gathered around her apartment to console each other and Riley's mourning daughters. Riley's three daughters, Shanta Perry, Monique Perry, 
and Yolanda Jackson believed that their mother had found relief in death. She no longer had to look over her shoulder and live her life in fear of Smith. Thank you for setting my mama free, is what Jackson said to Smith in court. Ernest Riley, the victim's brother, expressed his shock at his sister's horrific end, stating that he could not believe that Smith was capable of something like this. According to Riley, his sister had told him a couple of weeks before the dreadful day of her death that Smith had stopped stalking her and that he did not know where she lived. She also confided that she had left Smith because he had started using drugs. He also stated that she wanted Smith to get the death penalty for his heinous act. Smith was convicted of first-degree murder in August 2016 when he took a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. He was sentenced to life behind bars without the possibility of parole. The school district released a statement after hearing the news, stating that they were deeply saddened by the death of their beloved, long-serving bus driver. They stated that they are grateful for her many years of service to the students of the Palm Beach County School District and hope that her memory will serve as an example of the many caring drivers who are dedicated to the safety of our children. A GoFundMe page was also started to raise funding for Riley's funeral. 2,410 of $5,000 was raised. Stephen Port, AKA the Grinder Killer, murdered at least four gay men by overdosing them with lethal doses of the date rape drug GHB. The police investigation has been heavily criticized, some claiming that police could have stopped the killer earlier. Imagine the ambulance for the address of the emergency. Cook Street, there's a young boy who got his cats outside, I don't know. Outside of which number? Uh, 4758. Sorry? 4758, I think. 47. Cook Street. Yeah. What, what area? Parking. Looks like he's collapsed or anesthesia or something. Just always just drunk. Like, yeah. Okay. Where's the phone you're calling from? Uh, I'm just pulling up in the car. I've got to get my car to the parking. Oh, right, don't worry about that. What's the telephone number you're calling from? Hello? 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 Hello, the ambulance service. Well, I can't okay. there. Can you confirm the location? Oh, I'm just doing it right now. Um, Where was the first fellow outside of? Uh, Stephen Port. Yeah. Um, Cook Street. What's your number? Uh, 4758. What's your number? I don't know, I just... I didn't look. Uh, you've got 47 before. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, what's for some time? Yeah. Do you yeah. think that they had a seizure? Is that correct? It's a bit, um, man on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, were job, you but... passing by in your car? Yes. Okay, and you've drove past now, so you're no longer there. That's right. How old did he look, roughly, sir? 20. 20. Do you know if he was awake? No. Do you know if he was breathing? No, I don't know. Did you see anything happen at all? No. No. You just think they possibly had a piece of room lying there on the floor? Yes. And thanks for letting us know. We'll get someone there as soon as we can. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, sorry. It's the answer. Sorry to bother you again. Um, it was definitely Cook Street that the patient was on. Yes, definitely. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Boston. Or Boston and it was Cook Street. Okay, and then were you just kind of driving past and you just kind of saw the patient lying there? I was just driving at my car park. Oh, it was your car park there? So, in 994. Okay. I had a look at him. Yeah. Called you, but got back in the car. It's all right, no worries, no worries. Just wanted to be sure I've got someone there anyway. Um, thank you for your help. Sorry to bother you again. Okay, no worries. Right, thank you. Bye bye. A crime that shocked the nation and left the LGBT community of Britain shattered. Stephen Port drugged and raped four young gay men before murdering them and discarding their molested bodies in churchyards near his London flat between 2014 and 2015. Jack Taylor was found dead in September 2015, his body propped up against a wall of St. Margaret's Church in East London. It was only when this fourth victim was found that police were able to track down the killer who had lured his trusting victims to their demise using CCTV footage to identify the killer. 
But the tragic story of Jack Taylor was only the end to what began as a drug-fueled, perverse, and depraved addiction. The first victim was killed in June 2014. Local chef and art school dropout, Stephen Port, moved to Barking in East London in his 30s. He soon became friends with a neighbor, Ryan Edwards, who was also gay. It was no secret to Ryan that Port frequented many online dating sites. He created many profiles across various social media platforms, including Grindr, and also used profile photos that displayed images of himself from his younger days, and not the age that he really was. He made many false claims about himself. Port preferred younger men and struggled to get along with men his age. Ryan also noticed that the men Port had been seeing often had nothing nice to say about him, and some even seemed to be afraid of him. Port lived alone and did not have friends. He had no one to hold him accountable for his actions or behavior. And so, as one relationship came to an end, another began and was more violent and abusive than the one that came before. His life of drugs and violent behavior began to spiral out of control, and he began to embrace his depraved, perverse urges more and more. On the 15th of June, 2014, Port began communication with 23-year-old fashion student Anthony Walgate, whom he had met on an escort site. Port allegedly offered the student 800 pounds to stay the night. Walgate agreed, and the two arranged to meet. As a precaution, Walgate texted his friends about his plans, but shockingly, two days later, he was found dead outside of Port's flat. An anonymous call made to Triple Nine reported that a young male appeared to be unconscious or drunk outside of the apartment block where Port lived. The call had been made by the killer himself. When police arrived, they found that Walgate was dead and his bag was beside him. In it was an empty bottle of GHB. It appeared that Walgate had died from an overdose. The harrowing news devastated the young man's mother. Friends of Anthony told detectives that he had arranged to meet up with a man the same night that he went missing. Authorities soon determined that it was the same man who contacted Triple Nine, Stephen Port. On June 26, 2014, Port was arrested and his laptop was seized. His DNA was also taken. According to Port, the victim had taken drugs and fallen asleep. He allegedly then left the 23-year-old in his flat, and upon returning home from work later that day, he was still asleep. He then told police that the following morning, Port was dead. He reportedly panicked and carried the body outside before calling Triple Nine. The investigators believed his story. The killer had quite literally gotten away with murder. Authorities had missed their first opportunity to capture Port before he wreaked even more havoc on the gay community and go on to kill three more young men. Port was released on bail with a trial set for the 23rd of March, 2015. Many people, including Peter, believe that had police probed the case further and searched his laptop or phone records, the search history and chats on them could have shown a spotlight on the man as a potential killer. Only two months later and still out on bail, Port was back on Grindr, where he began chatting with 22-year-old Slovakian Gabriel Kovari, who had only recently moved into the country. The aspiring artist moved in with Port. John, a friend of Gabriel, also came forward later on, stating that police had not done enough to investigate the death of his friend who had spent the summer with him. Ryan and Gabriel started texting until suddenly the messages stopped. Ryan questioned Port on Gabriel's whereabouts. The court claimed to be unaware of where Gabriel had gone. On the 28th of August, 2014, only five days after Gabriel had moved in with Port, his lifeless body was found in the graveyard of St. Margaret's Church, propped up against a wall by a dog walker. When police arrived, they found GHB in his bag and believed that he had died from a drug overdose. But what they didn't know was that it was at the hands of a killer that had managed to slip through their fingers before. Less than a month later, a third victim was found dead. On the 18th of September, 2014, Daniel Whitworth, a local chef, met up with Port after meeting at an online dating site. Two days later, the 21-year-old was dead. His lifeless body was shockingly found in the same graveyard by the same dog walker who found Kovari. The news broke the heart of Daniel's stepmother. Unbeknownst to authorities, Daniel had not committed suicide. He, too, had been a victim of a toxic amount of GHB, and Port had feigned a suicide note from Daniel in which he wrote that he had killed Gabriel three weeks before 
and then placed his body in the same place as his previous victim. News of these deaths spread through the LGBT community like wildfire, and it became apparent, according to Peter Tatchell, human rights activist, that police did not release a public appeal or send out any information about an ongoing investigation. It was as if they were not connecting the cases, treating each as self-inflicted drug overdoses that were not suspicious at all. Port's murder spree came to a temporary halt when on the 23rd of March, 2015, he pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice in the case of Anthony Walgate. He was sentenced to eight months in prison but only served two. He was released on the 4th of June and freed to kill again. On the 14th of September, almost one year since Port's first victim, the body of forklift driver Jack Taylor was found dead under the same circumstances as the three preceding victims. Only this time, the victim's family would not take not suspicious as an answer. It was thanks to their demands to view the CCTV footage found of Jack that finally led to the arrest and conviction of Stephen Port. After viewing the footage, the footage of the tall blonde stranger walking beside Jack was appealed to the public, and police received confirmation that the man was in fact Stephen Port. In October 2015, Port was arrested and charged with the murders of Jack Taylor and Anthony Walgate, Gabriel Cavari, and Daniel Whitworth. Port was interrogated about his search history, which includes searches like boy drug raped, as well as videos found on his hard drive of Port having sex with unconscious men. Under questioning, Port confessed to meeting Whitworth at a sex party, but denied his involvement in his death as well as killing any of the young men in question. After his identity was made public, even more men came forward and reported being drugged and sexually assaulted at Port's flat after they had met him online. Port faced 29 separate charges of rape, sexual assault, administering a substance with intent, as well as murder. The 41-year-old pleaded not guilty. A trial began where the families of the victims came face to face with the killer of their loved ones. Evidence proving that Port was the killer was presented in court, including findings of his DNA on Gabriel Covari's glasses, as well as Daniel Whitworth's clothing. There was also the confirmation by experts that Daniel did not write the alleged suicide note. Ryan Edwards testified against his former neighbor during his trial. On the 23rd of November, 2016, Port was charged with a total of 22 offenses against 11 men, including four murders, four rapes, four sexual assaults, as well as 10 counts of administering a substance with intent. He was taken to Belmarsh Prison, where he would remain for the rest of his life. A month before Port was sentenced, the Metropolitan Police referred themselves to the IPCC who launched an independent investigation into 17 officers who handled the response to the four deaths. Police began to re-examine 58 unexplained deaths that also involved the date rape drug since Port's arrest. Around 10.15 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, March 12, 2009, a fire broke out in the kitchen of a house in Chicatawaga, Buffalo. As thick black smoke quickly filled the home, Kailisha Montero realized that she had no way out. Trapped in an upstairs bedroom, she wasn't just terrified for her own life. Kailisha was heavily pregnant and feared for the life of her unborn baby. Chicago 911 dispatch. What's going on? Where are you at? Where are you at? 56 Nantucket. What's the problem there? There's a fire. I'm pregnant. There's a fire in the house? Yes, please. Okay, come. get outside the residence. I can't. I can't get out. You can't get out of the house? No, please. No. Oh, front, can I have somebody else get on the phone here? No, I don't know how to is that. I'm in my room. Yeah, where's the fire? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm upstairs. Please, how do you please? Please. Oh, you are me. residential house fire number 56 Nantucket. Somebody's trapped in the house. Oh, my God. Okay, Please you're me. in the bedroom. You want to take this call? Call. Hello? 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 Stay in line. Please, Harry. Please. Yeah. Hello? Please, hurry up. Please. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am. Yes. Okay, well, what's the problem? Is your house on fire? <laughs> Get out of the house. <laughs> Ma'am. Get out of the house. Okay, can you go can you go to a bedroom window? Okay, okay, close the bedroom door, first of all. 
It is. It's okay, me. go to. I'm pregnant. Okay, okay, just calm down. Okay, stay low, low to the floor. Okay, the air's better down lower to the floor. Okay. Okay. Did you get to the window? Can you open the window? I did. I did. I did. Please, please come here. Please. We're gonna. Okay. Are you in the house by yourself? Yes. Yes. Please. Okay. We just want to make sure nobody else is in the house. Okay. I don't know if my dad's in here. I don't know. I was sleeping. You don't please. know if your dad may be in the house. Yes. Okay. Please come here, please. Okay, ma'am. Get to the window. Are you by the window? Yeah, my head is out the window. Okay, you're able to breathe out now, right? Yes. Okay, now that window, is it face the back of the house? It's in front of the house. It's in front of the house? Yes. Okay, as long as you can breathe, you're okay, right? Yes. Oh, my okay, God, what? please let me get you. Okay. Please, I'm begging you, please. Ma'am, there's people on the way, okay? Just remain calm, okay? you gotta, you got to be cool here now, okay? <laughs> don't, lose, don't lose composure. As long as you can breathe, you're okay. Okay. If it gets to a point where you can't breathe, then then climb out the window. But we got some people I on the way. I can't get out the window. I'm pregnant. I'm not even much. Okay, they're gonna do their best to to help you out. Okay. Can we get me, please? Okay, now you said your father may be in the house. What room would he be in? I want to get out of here. Oh, what? But... Ma'am, listen to yes. me. You said your father may be in the house. Yes, I think so. Does he live there? You please help me. What, ma'am, what room would he be in? I don't know. I think my mom had the phone when I'm pregnant. Can you please get me out? Please. Ma'am, okay. Oh, my God. What room, <laughs> what room would your father be in? He would be in the basement or his bedroom. The bedroom is right next door to my room. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, is, is, is his bedroom door closed or you don't know? I can't open my door. I can't open that door. Okay, stand the phone with me, okay? Yes. We'll get some people there to help you. Uh, <laughs> I heard a, a, bow, like a falling noise. I don't know my dad trying to get to me or something. He can't oh. Okay, stop. All right. I, I can't open this door. No. Come away, okay. please. Okay, now, what do you think the chances are he's in the basement or in his room? I don't know. He, he either be in the basement or his room. Please. Okay, oh, no, what time is this? Okay, this time, 10 o'clock in the morning. Where's he? He's in the basement sometimes, and the basement's on the couch, and then sometimes he leaves in his um, room. Okay, this time of the morning, can you, where would you guess? I don't know. Sometimes he leaves in the basement or in his room. Okay. You have to change the basement and in his room. Okay, stay in the phone. I'm going to let you know. my room. Okay, stay in, his room is right next to yours, right? It's right next door. Okay, stay in the phone. We don't hang up. Yeah. Please. Please help me. I'm gonna get out of here. I don't my dad be here. He's been out of I think he's gonna get my dad. I want you to get my dad. Where's my dad at? Dad. Okay, ma'am. Get my father to go home. Get my father out, please. He's in the basement of his room. Please. Please. He's either in his room or in the back next door to my room. Please get him out. Please, I need you. Okay, ma'am, is, is there somebody there with you? It's a fireman. It's one and only one. That house is big. We need more of a fireman. Okay, they're they're coming, ma'am. Come on, please. Go okay, just, you you have to please. calm down, okay? If you want to help your father, you're going to have to listen to me. If you want to help your father, you're going to have to listen to me. If you want to help your father, you're going to have to listen to me. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. The firemen are checking, okay? Okay. Okay. Now you can breathe. You're okay, right? Okay. I need to call my mom. I'm on a three-way. We'll, we'll get to that. We've got time for that. Okay? Come on. Come on, okay. please. Do you know what's burning? You kick it in. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, ma'am, do you know where the fire is? <laughs> okay, you got your head out the window? Huh? You have your head out the window? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got my head out the window because there's the smoke blowing my throat. 
Okay, as long as you can breathe. Uh, will you be able to sit out that window? No, I can't. I'm pregnant. I can't have a car to the window. Okay. You're okay, ma'am. Ma'am, as long as you, as long as you get air, you're okay, okay? Do you know, ma'am, do you know where the fire started? Assistant Chief Kurt Spieler of Forks Fire District 3 was the first responder to arrive at the house. Upon seeing Kailisha at the window, he got into full protective gear and entered the burning building. Inside, the visibility was near zero, and the 12-year-old volunteer firefighter was quickly forced to the floor by thick smoke. But luck was on his side. His childhood friend had lived just down the street in a house with the same layout, so he knew exactly where to find the stairs. Spieler passed the kitchen, which by this time was an inferno, and made his way up to the stairway. Once upstairs, the brave 29-year-old wasted no time in finding the trapped woman. He helped her escape the house and then went back into the blaze to look for her father. Thankfully, the woman's father wasn't home at the time, but the family's pet dog was. Firefighter Spieler got the dog out of the fire, but unfortunately it didn't survive. At the 102nd Annual Southwestern Association of Volunteer Firemen's Convention in Belmont, firefighter Kurt Spieler received a standing ovation when he was awarded with the Fireman of the Year Award for his brave rescue of the nine-month pregnant woman. On November 12, 2008, teachers arriving at Snipes Academy noticed a young man lying on the grass outside their elementary school. When they took a closer look, it was obvious that he was dead. Just before 7 a.m., with parents soon to arrive and school buses full of children already on their way, the principal dialed 911. Communications is room. This is Allison Ward, the principal at Snakes Academy. We have a dead body right out in front of our school on the grass area, but we're at the John C. Dorothy B. Johnson location. What is the address, ma'am? 1100 McCray Street. 1100 McCray, and is the person out there? Yeah, the, my custodian just said it's, it's a young boy, looks like a young man, and he's done the body stiff. But it's right out, like it's right across, we have a little grassy area right across from the school, you know, we're on that strange little... And are you, sure that, are you sure that he's in it? Well, he kicked him and he's stiff, he didn't move, he appears to be in rigor. His, there's blood coming out of his nose, I mean, I'm not going to touch him, but okay. I'd say he's definitely dead. Can you, I, I didn't call the emergency number just because we're about that serious. That's okay, care. how old does he appear to be? He looks like he's probably in his, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 18 to 22. Oh, we're right down from the Wilmington Police Department, so but we don't have a school resource. And office. you're at 1100 McCray? Yes. And you're the principal there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just stay on the phone for one minute, okay? Yes, ma'am, no problem. We'll go ahead and get some help started over there. 
Okay, we're going to need the medical examiner or whatever, I guess. Do we not have something else that... Is she a black or white male? Can you see? She's an African-American male. So that... We're covering the body so that if we have kids come, is that okay? Hang on a second. Let's make sure we're allowed to touch him. And he has blood coming from where? Don't touch him. We don't touch him. He has blood coming from where? blood coming from where? coming out of his um, right nostril that kind of ran down his nose. Okay, yeah. Don't touch him. Okay, don't touch him. So, we can we do we stuff? I don't know how we're going to... Are you saying he's stiff? Yes, ma'am. He's definitely stiff. Why don't you get on the phone and call Marie Barnhill and see if we can stop buses up, like maybe up by the boys and girls. Up. Because until we get this covered, we do not want children getting on this campus. And exactly where at, at the school is he? He's right. When you come out of our front entrance, there's McLean Street or Swan Street, whatever this goofy kind of street that comes around by the boys and girls club. Mm -hmm. He's right on the patch of grass across from where we park and where families drop their kids off and that kind of thing. Okay, will it be somebody there to meet the, the paramedics from the office? Or? Yes, ma'am. We're standing right after right now because we're going to try to figure out how to keep kids from coming on campus until we can at least get this scene secured so they're not looking at this. Okay, and um, is, I can tell you how to do CPR. Do you think it's... Well, no, ma'am. We definitely be on CPR, and, we'll, and we have several of them standing here trained first responders because he is not. Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> Did anybody see what happened? I was. was no, ma'am. We just. Uh, I came in the dark this morning. I was here at um, 515, 520, and I pulled in so the grounds were dark, so I didn't see anything. My head cut dirty and came in about six or so. Did you see him? Mm -hmm. So my, my assistant principal just drove in, you know, and she said there's somebody sleeping out across from school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. We have to wait till the um, they come to the scene. I don't know. It looks like something just came out of the nose. I'm on the with the field police. You know what we may need some help is if Paige is trying to call buses, it's just maybe stop parent traffic. But I don't think we should let kids or anybody on here until we have this cordoned off. Okay. That was probably not going to get on yet. Yeah, maybe it's just we can take the locked cars. That's a good idea. But we've got to get the paramedics in here first. Okay, and I'll, I'll notify the SROs and maybe they can get over there and help you out. That would be great. Um, yes. Deputy McMillan is at Virgo, and Deputy Curry is ours, and I know Sergeant Caesar share quite frequently. Okay, and you're at Snipes Academy, right? That's in the name of the school, but we're at the Dorothy B. Johnson site. Okay, but it's 1100 McRae Street? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, I have everybody on the way over there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Just keep everybody away from him, yes, away from the area as much as possible. Okay. So if they, they need to investigate um, the surrounding area, just don't let anybody keep going up to him and walking around that area. Okay, great. And, um, and they should be there shortly. Okay, if thank they, you. Okay, if anything changes before they get there, just call us back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. School buses were diverted to a nearby middle school, and parents were sent home before they could turn into the school where the body lay. Given the age of the victim and the location of his body, Wilmington police immediately treated the young man's death as a homicide. An examination later revealed the cause of death to be a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. Aguana Walker was one of the parents who had driven to the school and was turned away by police. Unable to drop her six-year-old daughter at school, but grateful they hadn't seen the body, Aquana called her boss, who suggested she pray for the dead man. In a shocking turn of events, the homicide victim was identified as her 19-year-old son, Darian Terrell Walker, just hours after she arrived home. Amazingly, Darian's killer was already communicating with police and had even told him about the murder. New Jersey Bloods gang member Jaquay Lashansa Banks had been arrested that same morning after she held up a nearby restaurant. The 19-year-old was also the prime suspect in an attempted murder that happened a month earlier. On October 16, 2009, Banks had sold heroin to 18-year-old Edward Booth, but had shot him in the neck as she tried to steal the drugs back. The bullet lodged in his jaw, and he was lucky to escape with his life. However, when police asked what had happened, the victim refused to say who shot him. The gang member had approached Darian the day before, but rather than sell him drugs as she had implied, she stole his iPhone. Darian worked for a local restaurant and wasn't known to have any involvement in drugs. Those that knew him struggled to understand why anyone would want to end his life. His funeral was held on November 19th at Miracle Temple Ministries Church, and he was buried in the Walker Family Cemetery in Burgaw.
Jaquela Banks was charged with first-degree murder and robbery with a dangerous weapon and held at the new Hanover County Jail on $2 million bond. She avoided a trial and possible life sentence by taking a plea and was sentenced to 14 to 18 years. Darian's parents showed incredible strength by not only facing their son's killer, but also forgiving her. Darian's mother said she prayed for the murderer and said God loves her despite what she's done. In September 2009, the convicted murderer pleaded guilty to charges surrounding firearms and organized crime. For this, she was sentenced to 10 years, which she's currently serving alongside her murder sentence. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting, and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.